Hey, without further ado, uh, no breaks. We'll go right to him. He's been on hold. Uh, it's been a while since we've had our uh, good friend, uh, Doug Siscon. He made some appearances a couple of years ago, and he's joining us, uh, unfortunately, because of the sad news about the passing of Gary Carter, and he's with us now. Doug, pleasure to have you on. How you doing? Good, thanks. What? Give us, I guess, you know, your reaction, you know, hearing the sad news about Gary Carter and uh, obviously it was somewhat uh you people were prepared because of, of the you know the obviously the nature of of the illness but give us some of your thoughts about when you heard about it and what was going through your mind well uh, last may is when i believe he was diagnosed with it and i got a call from uh, his agent uh Mead Chafsky, uh to let us know in fact he let everybody know that uh, they had found some some spots on his on his brain that was inoperable, and at that point I just like went, uh, wow, um, where did this all come from? And uh, apparently it happened very quickly, and uh, he you know was getting dizzy and and uh, you know this thing uh, moved very rapidly, and uh, then obviously got into some radiation chemotherapy, and uh, it uh, it just just made him more miserable I think down the line and a uh, yeah, very aggressive cancer. Uh, so. When you you look now on in a situation like this, you look back at the good times. You know Gary mm-hmm. came to New York in 1985. You were part of that staff. Um, what I know you and I were talking a little bit off air. Your first introduction to Gary was not when he came to the match. You actually uh, interacted with him a little bit before then. Yeah, in fact, he was with the Expos uh, when I was with the Mets. My first game I pitched in. One of the first games I pitched in was against the Expos in '82. But in 1983, we were both on uh, Good Morning America with David Hartman and Joan London doing a bubblegum blowing contest. And Gary uh, would not chew bubblegum unless he had his sugar-free bubblegum. So it was really wow. kind of funny. Yeah. That's, it was your sugar-free, Doug? I, <laughs> he had some. I, I think I chewed his gum as well. But uh, it was nice to meet him. It was really cool. Uh, to, to get a chance to see see this guy, you know, after I I had had an opportunity to pitch against him, but uh, and then uh, you know a year or two later he's he's uh, running the things uh, behind the plate for the Mets. When you talk about him in his prime, and and I and I know he dipped mm-hmm. off a little bit after '86, but in his prime '85, '84, earlier than that when you faced him, talk about the kind of yeah. hitter he was. He was he was a tough out, uh, Doug. Oh, uh, extremely. And, of course, that entire Expo team was, was filled with all-stars. Uh, they, you know, and the funny thing about that club is they never really did anything. I mean, they had great players, but, you know, you go up and down that lineup and you got to face Wallach and Carter and uh, Andre Doss and Tim Raines. All There was just no let-up in the, in the lineup. And Gary, to me, was always a huge threat, you know, to hit the ball in the gap off me or hit a ball out of the ballpark. And, you know, especially being a catcher and 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 being a hitter, you gotta if you're struggling behind the plate, you gotta step it up and hopefully you know win a ball game hitting. And if you're not hitting well, you gotta help it out behind the plate. So it's a very difficult, uh, tough position that being a catcher uh, for all those years behind the plate. Had Jody McDonald on, who was a dad, used to be the GM of of the Mets and the Cardinals. We were talking a little mm-hmm. bit about from '84 to '85. You know, you were part of that '84 team. You guys were finally winning under David Johnson. You had Keith Hernandez. He was the you know the veteran leader. But then you know he was one type of veteran leader. You know, Gary came in and was a, a kind of they played off of each other. They were different personalities and they and they meshed well. Uh, and Gary, in a lot of ways, um, maybe this is overstating a little bit, but from hearing the reaction from the fans, uh, hearing about the trade at Madison Square Garden during the Knicks game and chanting, let's mm-hmm. go Mets, it reminds me of when Mike Piazza came over in 98 and had that energy to the franchise. Maybe a little bit different, but talk about that, because you were part of that 84 to 85, and, and, and you saw for yourself in that clubhouse the impact of Gary. Oh, yeah, and especially back then because Frank Cashin was putting the pieces together to to build a team to hopefully compete in the National League East there. And and once we got Gary and brought him over, I mean, it it made sense to the rest of the, you know, dynamic players such as Hernandez and, and of course, Ray Knight being very well outspoken in the clubhouse and Mookie Wilson being quiet. And I mean, it was just a nice check and balance amongst, you know, amongst all of them. And, you know, we had really a cool sprinkling of veterans, uh, with some guys in the middle there, and then obviously some rookies. So these guys like like Gary uh, very much kept all of the other guys kind of in line, uh, you know, very quiet in a very mature way. 
uh, a little difference there between some of the other guys. I mean, Gary was very mature and, uh, you know, never said a bad word and always positive to all of us players. I mean, always was hoping and rooting for everybody because, you know, he'd been around a team that had a little bit of uh, adversity to it. You know, a lot of people – uh, you know, in Montreal, that club was a little bit different than most. You know, I'm not saying they argued or fought amongst each other, but there was some jealousy and this and that of, amongst the players in New York. A little bit different with this club. We were all live wires. I mean, and uh, he, he basically uh, kept everybody uh, focused on what they needed to do to win. And the amazing part about that 85, he got off to a little bit of a slow start in 85, mm-hmm. uh, heated up in the middle of the year, but... If you look at his September, and you guys were right there with the Cardinals. I mean, you won 97 games. Uh, actually, you won 100 yep. games. You didn't make the playoffs. Yep. And um, he, in, in September and October, that was that five weeks, the final five weeks of the season, had uh, in 125 at-bats, 13 home runs, 36 RBIs, a 320 batting average, uh, uh, on-base percentage over 400, an OPS over 1,000. I mean, he just – I mean, he carried you guys. I know Keith was huge offensively, mm-hmm. strawberry hitting the clock. I, I get all that. But this is a catcher, a guy who caught that pitching staff. And here he is just literally uh, producing at an, uh, at an historic rate those last five weeks. Yeah, and, you know, again, we talked about it just a, just a minute ago on the catching side. I mean, he, he's out there just getting beat up. And, you know, may not have had the best uh, defensive day of the, of the year or what have you, but – you know, he'd always find a way to, to, you know, get us get us where we needed to be, and especially in the hitting, which you were just talking about. I can recall in 85, my God, he was on a tear. And I had been struggling at that point pretty much most of the year, and we won a big game in Los Angeles where Mookie had hit a home run, and, and I got the final out uh, with a guy against uh, the Dodgers, and, man, he comes flying out from behind that play. This was like a 15-inning ball game where he'd been just beat up. And... He comes flying out there and jumps into my arms like a big kid, and he was so happy, you know, uh, that that we had won that ball game. And then of course, you know, me, later on, I have with me Doug Sisk, former Mets pitcher, and and Doug, I'd also like to get a point of view from you. I've list, I listened to Coney a little bit talk about the impact that Carter had on him when he came over as a young pitcher. And let's face it, you had a lot of talent on that pitching staff. You had Gooden, you had uh, Darling, you had Fernandez, you had Aguilera, so on and so forth. But they were young. You were young. You guys were a little erratic at times. And and when Carter came in, and, and Cohn described it as someone who was really able to help manage that, he worked the umpires. He had respect from the umpires. Uh, you know, his defense, I know towards the end of his career, he, he didn't throw that well. Vince Coleman ran all over the field on him. But he was more than just that. He was uh, he was important to you guys. I mean, talk about that. Oh, extremely. And, and you know, I, I, he – Every pitcher in that club was a little bit different. Everybody had a little, quite a bit different stuff. I mean, I had a sinker ball. Bobby Ojeda had a great changeup. Orozco had a great slider and a good fastball. Dwight had a buckling curve. So he he knew, you know, uh, how to catch those balls, to make it look good going over the plate. I mean, he, he also knew, you know, your strengths. And he always let you, you know, if you're ever going to get beat or anything was going to happen, it was always, you know, they're going to beat you with your best pitch. And we never let you give in to anybody. And, uh, you know, if there was ever a pitch or something like that, you shook him off or something, he'd come out and he'd talk, you know, hey, this is what's going to happen. So there was a lot of thought in this game. Again, it goes back to catchers. It's so difficult, you know, to, to have a, a, an offensive game. If you're not having a great offensive game, then you got to go back, take that away from the plate after you've had a struggling offensive, and then go back there and deal with these young pitchers. Uh, you know, and Dwight, obviously, one of the most devastating pitchers i ever seen. In, in, in the game of baseball. I mean, and it must have been a joy for Gary to catch it. Because not only did he throw hard, he had nasty stuff, but he also knew where he was throwing it as well. Hey, um, while I have you on, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know the big the big story here on the Yankee side, you heard us talking a little bit, is the acquisition of Michael Pineda uh, yeah. from Seattle. I know you're out in the Seattle area. You, you do some some broadcasting out there. You 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 know, a couple of years ago when some of the you know the Yankees uh, brought over a couple of guys like Richie Sexton and so on. Ibanez, as we were talking about, you had a, a good yeah. point of view on young pitcher. You know, you're a pitcher. You you have a good eye for this stuff. Give us a little scattering point with Michael Pineda. You saw him a little bit, I know, in the minor leagues as well as last year in, in Seattle. What could Yankee fans expect to see? Because they're very excited about this kid. Yeah, he's he's, he's a big kid. He's he's tall, lanky, with big hands. He's got, you know, he's got a tremendous fastball. He uh, 
you know, he, he's right on top of you, too, because he's such a big kid. Um, I think, I think well, he struggled a bit with Seattle towards the end of last year. He obviously made the American League All-Star team. But I think, you know, it's going to be uh, – he's going to be under the microscope coming there to New York, obviously. I mean, it's it's one thing to pitch well in Seattle and lose, a, lose your ball games here and there. But, man, you got to you – gotta, they're expecting you to him to be a winner. So I think they're going to – he's going to have to step it up there a little bit on that, on that side of it because I definitely saw that falling off the mark towards the end or the middle of last year in his season. Again, they were contemplating even sending him down to the minor leagues after he had, he had made the all-star team. So, um, you know, you have a bad game in New York. We all know how that goes. You know, then right. the brain starts working and, and whatever. But, you know, he has another guy there in Seattle as well, Felix Hernandez, who's a quality pitcher. And I think maybe he's kind of hanging around Felix and thinking maybe he is Felix when when really he's not there yet. So he's going to have to find his own his own way. And, uh uh, the Yankees have got a good arm. Hopefully they don't, uh, you know, burn him out. What? Uh, how did you like coming? I know you're at City Field a little bit this past spring. How did you like coming to the big ballpark? And uh, wouldn't you have liked to maybe pitch in that cavernous? Well, it's not going to be as cavernous this year, but you would have liked to pitch a little bit in that outfield, put that outfield behind you. Yeah, you know that thing is, I didn't when I pitched in New York, I didn't give up very many home runs at Shea Stadium because the dimensions were such, and and not a lot of back in the '80s when we. T- Pitching in the minor leagues, all the stadiums were at the same dimensions as Shea. But yeah, I know that there was some some uh, um, some of the players for the Mets were a little unhappy with the fact that the ball didn't carry very well in that ballpark. Well, I'm saying stop whining. I mean, <laughs> as a pitcher, you know, I had to pitch in Detroit, I had to pitch at uh, you know in, in uh, Boston, I had to pitch in Seattle, and both of these ballparks where it was tradition. And those pitchers even said, the heck with tradition. Burn these places down. You know, these guys are getting away with murder with these small fences. But, um, you know, you, you hit the ball hard. You know, some of your teams are geared towards these types of fields, too. I mean, back when the Houston Astros were in, in the in the Dome, I mean, their their team was built, built for speed, hitting gaps, things of that nature. It was difficult to hit the ball in the ballpark, and, and that's how they did it. So um, we'll see how it all goes there. But a beautiful ballpark. Um, I don't understand is why are they making these ballparks smaller as far as it, you know uh, uh, the attendance? How many how many people does it hold? Well, I think part of that is the sixty thousand seat ballpark. You don't have as many amenities. They they instead of putting I guess the extra seats, they put the extra amenities mm-hmm. like the Shake Shack and there's some bad okay. views. So those seats kind of go. I mean at Chase Stadium, I mean you sit back over by the foul pole or up in the upper yeah. deck. Those are pretty bad seats. Although, you know, you're in the bullpen. You had to hear it from the fans yelling over you over there. Yep. So, you know, and, and I defended you on Twitter. I don't know yep. if you're on Twitter, Doug. They replayed, they replayed, the, um, they replayed the Carter game, the, the, his initial game yep. in 85. And uh, you blew a save that day. And uh, I said to everybody, you're all getting angry at Doug Sisk, uh, tw- you know, th- almost 30 years after the fact. But a he set up the home run because if you didn't blow if you didn't blow the save, you see, yeah. there's no heroics. B the Cardinals dinked you to death and you lost a little. You hit a batter. I think you hit Tommy Hur in the ninth inning. Um, you, you struck out. T- <laughs> you almost got out of it. You were a little. You looked a little. It was opening day, Doug. I'll tell you, uh, yeah. independent observer looking back, you looked a little nervous that day coming in with the. Well, with you, the, you never you, you never know. I mean, it was a long time. And you know, in those games when you do feel a little nervous and the and the game is over and you go in the clubhouse, you just slap yourself around and go, God, how can I be nervous? And I've done this so many different times and and have done it, but that's the thing about baseball; it's never the same. And yeah. There was a game, I'm trying to remember if it was 80s. It would have been 85, and you can quote me on 85 or 86, the big game in Atlanta that went 16 innings. Do you remember that one? Uh, yes, oh, where, 85, uh, yes. We, we did a show about that game. That was a wild one. Oh, Gary caught that entire game. And when that game was over with, I can recall us leaving the clubhouse and, uh, you know, a couple of guys had just, just finished the whole game and they were popping a beer at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Right. Because and he, poor it's Gary important. His that knees, whole game. It, you know, um, um, his knees, and you know this, yep. his knees were not good even when he came over. It was uh, I remember uh, Andre Dawson was, uh, was doing an interview, mm-hmm. and he talked about how he and both Carter, who both played yep. on the, uh, the, the Olympic Stadium turf, were yep. were basically in the training room every day, and you know, you as a pitcher, you you had injuries. 
Uh, but you have mm-hmm. to admire day in and day out, knowing yeah. how hard it is to catch a big league ball game. And he he didn't catch 90 games. He caught 140, 145 yep. games. Uh, yep. You know, it's pretty amazing how he he withstood the um, the beating that he took. Oh, and 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 you know, you you can always figure you know you're going to get dinged. Uh, a, a couple times during the game, and I can always recall getting into the game in the eighth or ninth, and that foul tip that comes off and hits Gary right up in that top shoulder area, right off the top, or inside the leg part there, just takes a big bite out of them. And you know, they, all they got to do is just grab a little dirt, just kind of, you know, grit their teeth and go, Ugh, you know, and why did it have to wait all the way to the eighth or ninth inning to do it, you know? And right, and you know, either he's they're back there by themselves. You know, with this whole thing, just sucking it up, and when they got to come out and run out and talk to the pitcher, you know, you never rarely see the pitcher go in and talk to the catcher, obviously, because you know you don't want to be too close to the batter. But, but it's always the catcher. He's always the one that's going to come up, do that after you just beat the heck out of him. Right. And he's going to come out there and talk to you. you know, right. It, it just, it's just, a, it's just amazing. And I, I look back in those days, he's always smiling, no matter what was going on, man. I mean, there was very rarely. There was a time in in Pittsburgh we had a, a, a an after the game of a spread we called it, and the clubhouse guy in Pittsburgh's name was Mooch, and he was probably one of the notorious clubhouse guys that never gave us good food. It was awful. It was stuff that we probably <laughs> got out of the frozen bins. It was it was generic peanut butter just said peanut butter, beer just said beer, bread said bread, and we had just gotten through a huge game in Pittsburgh. Won the ball game. We come in there and Mooch had put out this absolutely nasty looking greasy Salisbury steak crap with instant mashed potatoes. Gary came in there with his with his front of his his uh, catcher's gear still on. Looked at it, picked it up and just threw it across the clubhouse <laughs> and said, "I'm taking them, you guys all out for dinner." And that's what he did. Hey, <laughs> listen, Doug. I've never seen him. Great talking to you. Got to run, but thanks for keeping in touch and let's let's do it again. All right. Unfortunately, not a great time to talk about a bad thing, but you shared some great stories about Gary. Thank you so you much. You guys, you guys take care. Good luck to you. That's uh, Doug Sisk, former Mets pitcher. Some.